used to be very interesting and find myself in the craziest of circumstances. Like I went to go renew my driver's license at the DMV and they told me I couldn't because there was a warrant out for my arrest for, uh, <laughs> for murder. And I was like, what? <laughs> this is Dr. Emily Belchettis. She's a professor of psychology at New York University and she's dedicated her research to figuring out how visualization can better help us stay motivated and achieve our goals. First of all, when we set goals, yes, we need to have that long-term vision, but we need to couple it with concrete action planning in the here and now. We're not very good personal accountants. Our brains have evolved to have us not remember everything, but to remember some things. Multitasking is a tool. We want to finish it up, right? We are motivated and we push towards the finish line. We push through as if we're, you know, a runner who's told, don't run to the finish line, run past the finish line, run through the finish line. Is there actually a combination between what we perceive we can achieve and what we can actually achieve? A hundred percent. And it comes down to this you know, like this mind body connection that we have that, you know, people talk about that phrase a lot in a lot of different contexts. And, and then we have cliches like seeing is believing. So yeah, there is true science behind that. And a lot of it comes down to motivation. What you see is going to shape your whole mindset, your whole approach to the world and what you're capable of doing. And so uh, if we take a step back, I mean, how the heck does someone, I mean, I, I know that you're a doctor of psychology and you're a professor, but how do you fall into dedicating your life to, to, like, to, to helping us figure out how to stay motivated and achieve goals and what we can visualize and what we can perceive? Yeah, well, it's, well, you're jumping in at like 20 years where it began. But the true story is that I wanted to go on vacation. That's like, honestly, where it started. I was in my first year of grad school at Cornell, and I just really wanted to go to Europe for the summer. And I looked to see like, hey, how can I get to Europe? Conferences are the way that academics do it. There was no conference that was in my field. And so I just had to start doing something so that I could go to Europe. So I did. I just did one little study made one little poster and presented it in Glasgow to for you know an hour but used that to justify being away for 2 months from from my job which was being a graduate student and so that idea uh, had some legs my advisor was like let's build this out more and then 20 years later this this is where we are so really it was a <laughs> fluke and uh wanting to go on vacation I love that so much because often when I'm looking forward at things, like I want to connect the dots, right? Like I want to be like, okay, if, if I make the right choice now, it's going to lead to this and lead to this and lead to that. And then honestly, like I went to film school. I wanted to be an architect. I went to film school because I thought it would be easier. And I was afraid to become an architect. And that totally shaped my life. I yeah. love that you're like, if I'm being honest, I just wanted to go to Europe. Yeah, seriously. And actually, you know, in, in my undergrad, I studied music performance. I wanted to be a rock star. And uh, like that was that was my path until, you know, life told me otherwise. You know, I had a taste of it. That was a lot of fun. But but in the end, it was psychology for me. And then this research is because of vacation. Yeah. Huh. If you can share with me how it was that you were able to figure out how closely tied motivation is and in, in terms of goal setting, in terms of what we can believe we can achieve. I believe it started with like a trip out to like a local gym or something. Yeah, I mean, that that was a big point in this research. You know, I had the opportunity to talk with some Olympic athletes, amazing people like the fastest guy out of Trinidad, gold medalists at Olympics, you know, people who've trained alongside Hussein Lightning Bolt, fastest man on the planet. So amazing people that just happened to be uh, in Brooklyn at a YMCA. It was a former armory building. You know, there's high schoolers, there's, you know, new moms with their strollers. And then there's these incredible athletes. And they're such humble, in this case, guys, they were guys that I had no idea until somebody pointed out like those people, those people are like legit famous. <laughs> so, all right, cool. Let's, let's chat with them. And, you know, I went into this, you know, thinking I had a hypothesis as scientists do that, like they have amazing powers of perception. I think they probably have eyes that are killer eyes. You know, I'm sure they're beautiful eyes, but also that they can do amazing, like superpower kinds of things that they can focus on where it is that they're going, that they can take in all of their surroundings. They know where they are relative to all of their, all of their competition. So I interviewed these guys and I was wrong. I was totally wrong. They don't have, maybe they have amazing powers of perception, but they say they don't really pay attention to what's going on in the periphery. It's almost as if they have blinders on and they're just focused on a goal, on their on the finish line or on some sort of mark or target that they have, that that's what they were doing. 
So uh, there's lots of things that are different than between me and, and those Olympic athletes. <laughs> Um, but that was one that I could put my finger on is that they're, they're looking at the world in a different way than what my intuition was about how to run faster. And so that's really where, you know, that's where one of these big pivot point was for me. I thought, you know, a lot of us struggle to exercise. We want to get more steps in. We want to be able to run faster, walk farther uh, if we are concerned or, you know, focusing on, on our health and fitness. And what these athletes were telling me was something that, I can teach this to people, right? It wasn't intuitive for me. It may not be intuitive for others. And while they are incredible, what they were talking about wasn't really incredible. It was just different. It was just different than what I thought. So I taught people like, hey, imagine that you have a spotlight shining just on a target. Maybe it's a stop sign. Maybe it's a really interesting building that you always thought was like a little bit too far to walk to. Imagine you have blinders on the sides that you're not really paying attention to the periphery and focus on that target until you hit it. And then maybe set the next target and focus on that till you hit it and then and, and so on. And when we talk that to people in the lab, first of all, it's super easy to follow. They can understand that. And when we ask them, like, what are you looking at? What's capturing your attention? We know that they can adopt that style of like narrowed looking and that it's different than what they do naturally. That's not what we are naturally inclined to do. We do pay attention to what's on the sides. We do turn our heads. We are, you know, giving weight to what is in our periphery. But importantly, when people do that, when they adopt this narrowed style of looking, what we found is that they walked 23% faster and they said it hurt 17% less. The exercise was exactly the same. We had set up this like, you know, little op, this little course for them. We knew the distance was exactly the same. It's just that when we flipped a coin and decided who to teach the strategy to and who not, those that adopted this no style of attention were able to exercise more efficiently. When I when I heard that, I was just like I thought back to my own time in the gym and I, you know, up until 4 years ago I was I never worked out, I never dieted, I lost 70 pounds. Like I've had this transformation. So people who are meeting me for the first time, honestly they're like you're a super athletic. I'm like, "Thank you." But uh <laughs> but only up until about 2 years ago did I get this way. <laughs> and so I'm learning all this stuff for the first time and uh when I'm running, I've noticed I'm running on the treadmill. Uh I was in this competition where in the month of August we just had to see who could run the furthest in the month of August in our gym. I did not row as hard. I didn't really row at all. I did not work as hard on the floor. During the day when I wasn't in the gym, I would sit down more than work at my standing desk. Like I shifted my entire world. And even on the treadmill, I shifted all of my speeds just to try and eke out every like distance, like the biggest distance possible. And suddenly when I shifted everything around me to this laser focus of like the only thing that matters is these 23 minutes today, on the treadmill because I'm in this competition. Suddenly, I got great results. Yeah, and totally. I've done that a few other times in my life, and I'm always so surprised that if I put everything onto this one goal, it like happens really quickly. Like you can lose a lot of weight, or you can work on your running, or you can sell more. You can do like whatever you put all your focus into. Is that just what you're talking about? Yeah. I mean, you've touched on so many important things in there, but just to riff off of one of them and we can come back to all the amazing nuggets that you put in. But, you know, one idea you're talking about is multitasking and is multitasking is that good for trying to get stuff done? You know, there's so much, there's, there's so much like folklore about multitasking. There's so many values that are placed on multitasking and we all have our, probably our own thoughts on, do we love it or do we hate it? But I encourage us to think about it in a different way. Multitasking is a tool. It's neither good nor bad. It's a strategy that we have that we can deploy at the right time when we're trying to get something done. Now for you, that was being the best that you could and eking out the competition for that month that you were on the treadmill. Um, and for lots of us, it can just be something like a normal part of our day. There was, I, I was looking at monster.com a while back to see like, what do people think about multitasking? Is this something that employers want? Should this be something that we're cultivating? And it's one of the most frequently cited characteristics that employers are looking for in, in employees, but it, we don't really like the feeling of multitasking for the most <laughs> Not part. At all. No, I hate it. Right. And it was a lesson that I had to learn sort of the hard way when I had my first kid a couple of years ago. You know, and I was still like, I'm going to still be a scientist. I'm going to be like the super mom. And like, I'm going to be an awesome, cool person and a great friend. And it's like, I try to do all of that at once. And I realized I just, I'm awful at all of it, <laughs> right? I'm not enjoying my time being a mom. I'm not, in, I'm not doing good work as a scientist. Like multitasking doesn't work for me. 
and and I had to you know have like hold on. Did, does it actually work for anyone? You think it does? So there's you know there's a really cool study that was done with emergency room doctors, and this was you know a statistician analyzed how good are doctors, emergency room doctors, as multitasking increases for them. So what's really interesting about ER doctors, right, is that they have no idea what this shift is going to present. They could have one patient, they could have seven, eight patients that they're handling simultaneously. That's requiring that they multitask. And even within these patient loads, like there's times when they're waiting for results from another doctor or consultation or for lab work to come in and they have to kind of put that on pause and then switch to handling another patient case. That's another way that multitasking plays out. Like you get partway through something and then you have to pause and then you got to turn to something else and then you got to come back and, and there's costs to that, right? It's hard for our brain to like juggle or toggle between tabs, if you will. But what they found was that emergency room doctors actually were more efficient as their patient load increased. As it went from one to two, two to three, they were able to sort of, you know, uh, digest all the information that they were getting in at a faster clip. So the amount of time per patient was going down and they weren't making mistakes. They indexed that by looking at how frequently do the patients come back within a 24 hour period of time. If you come back within 24 hours, it probably means that you got misdiagnosed or you didn't get the right sort of treatment prescribed to you to get the job done. So what they found was that like increase in patient load actually helped increase the efficiency of the doctor's work, the, their ability to do their job well. But there was a tipping point between five and six patients and then and then beyond. Then the amount of time per patient increased and the number of patients that were coming back within a day also increased, suggesting that, you know, doctors now like we're slowing down as they're trying to toggle between all these open tabs and making mistakes, not necessarily fatal ones, right? But just like not doing their job as well. So it's kind of like a U shape, right? Multitasking is good. It can, it can, and what it does is sort of like act as a, a good form of stress. Some stress is good or engagement, right? It's like, okay, here's a challenge that I like to handle. These are people who chose to be emergency room doctors. So it's like an investment. It's almost, you know, increasing their motivation and a, and a challenge that they know they have the resources to take on and do, do well with. So that's why you see performance increasing with a small amount of multitasking, but there are limits to what we can handle cognitively. And then you see the drop off afterwards. So I think that's a great study for illustrating how multitasking is a tool. If we can self-diagnose, even if we're not emergency room doctors, is this something I have a lot of expertise in or is it something that's kind of new? Is it something that requires all different kinds of my brain parts to be operating together as one um, or not? Would I benefit from, from multitasking? Is it a, a form of stress, a good kind of stress that's going to get me engaged and get me excited about what it is that I'm doing again? Mm -hmm. And so you were saying that you're not great at multitasking because I interrupted your story. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, on the treadmill where I'm just like, I'm going to focus all of my time on this. I'm going to focus all of my energy on this. And I would even tell myself, right, like these are the only 23 minutes that matter today. If I have to lay in bed for the rest of the day, it doesn't matter. These are the only 23 minutes that matter because this is, this is why I'm here. I feel like that that's that like spotlight focus you're talking about. Yeah, for sure. You know, especially for when we're like trying to push over some, you know, a finish line, either a literal finish line or something that has to do with our goal. There's, you know, classic motivation research has found that like we double down, our efforts increase, the amount that we invest into something as that finish line, either literally or figuratively comes into view, we want to finish it up, right? We are motivated and we push towards the finish line. We push through as if we're, you know, a runner who's told, you know, don't run to the finish line, run past the finish line, run through the finish line. And there's a lot to be said for that, whether we're, you know, like literally, you know, running or we're running towards some other goal that we're trying to accomplish. Um, that's called the goal gradient theory is that as we get closer to the finish line, for the most part, we're excited to finish it up. And so we double down on our efforts. And so when you were working with these runners and you noticed that they would pick like a sign or they would pick a pair, you know, a single thing on someone's pair of shorts that they would be catching up to. This all makes sense to me. Like I, I naturally do this. I run Spartan races or I've started. And if there's someone in front of me, it's like, oh, I can match their pace. I know if I'm ahead or if I'm behind or I kind of want to beat them and I kind of want to push. And if there's no one around, it's like, I might as well walk. I mean, it's like so hard for me to conceptualize that that like I'm up against this clock and that I'm really running against myself. And so this comes now, I feel like this comes naturally to me. Like I'm always gaming. I'm always trying to figure out how to get better and better. Does this come naturally to most people or is this something that, that we really need to be aware of and, and learn? 
you know, I like to think about, about it as a tool. We all have a toolbox of tricks that are going to help us to, to meet our goals. And this is just one of those tools that are available to us. Like this narrowed focus of attention is something that we can use in certain moments to help us push across that finish line. And yeah, what we have found is that, you know, these like these Olympic athletes, this is what they do. And they kind of had a hard time articulating it. You know, I had to almost pretend like I was Freud or something and, and ask them, what about this possibility? What about this? And then they think about it. It wasn't just like off, off the, off the cuff. They knew what they, what they do. And actually one of their trainers told me, yeah, you can talk to them, but there's just something inherent in what they do as if, you know, they're, they're gifted with this ability and they may not be able to tell you what it is that they're doing, but sure, go ahead and talk to them. And it, yeah, and it did take a little bit. So I think for them, it did come naturally. This is something that they do and maybe it gets cultivated, but, um, but it's, it's just something that's sort of a part of them that they didn't even realize necessarily as part of their strategy. And that's true for other people too. We've done work with like thousands of runners, actually, few of whom have won, won gold medals, but like some of me, people and what differentiates like the really good runners and then the fine runners is their use of this strategy, the strategic use of the narrowed focus of attention. You know, we can differentiate the, the top quarter from the look from the lowest quarter of 5k runners based on the intensity that they use that narrowed focus of attention as the race goes on. And again, it's not something necessarily that they're like, yes, hundred percent, this is going to work but it's something that they happen to use a little bit more often or that is coming a bit more naturally to them than those who are are running in the in the, the bottom of the pack. I mean, we're talking about running now, we're talking about exercising, but I imagine this can be applied to other areas of our life in terms of business goals or growth goals or relationship goals or other things. Is is that the case? Yeah, totally. So, I mean, like we're talking about physical distance here and a strategy you can use when you're sort of mapping out your place within physical distance, but there's other forms of distance too that matter and that are relevant to our goals, like temporal distance, the dimension of time. And that's a challenge for a lot of the different goals is that we got to make choices today that might be tricky, that might require sacrifice so that we benefit in the far off future, that that temporal finish line might seem impossibly far off to, to really help us in the moment today to make that choice that we need to. You know, one example of this, you know, I worked on a project with, with some of my students, you know, about 60 students who were all in their last year of college, all on the brink of graduating. They all had jobs to pay their expenses. And I asked them, how many of you are saving for retirement right now? Like they're 21, 22 <laughs> years old. Yeah, right? Uh, how many of them? Zero? <laughs> 55 out of 60. And I wondered about those last five. <laughs> like, are you really telling the truth here? Because I certainly wasn't at 21, 22 years old, saving for retirement. And did an interview with them, you know, asked them why, why are you not saving for retirement? No judgment here, um, but why not? And one of the most commonly offered answers was because it just seems so far away. Like, yeah. Retirement. Yeah, so much living and so many more important things to do between now and then. A hundred percent. And that was, you know, part of it is like, also, who is that retired per Like, who's going to get that money, right? Who is that retired me? Like, what am I going to be like in retirement? I don't even know who that person is. And that really resonated with um, some of the core findings from that Hal Hirschfield, a, a professor at UCLA that he found also is just that we have a hard time imagining what that future is going to be like. So of course we have a hard time making sacrifices today when we have no idea even like concretely who's going to benefit in the future, even if it's us. Because I don't know who that person, that future self actually is. Yeah. So I tried to use some strategies of visualization to connect the dots, to pull today and the future a little bit closer. Um, so I took a picture of their faces and I used some you know, computer software and morphed them with a successful older person like Maya Angelou, Dan Rather, Betty White. <laughs> and I created this movie so that they could see themselves right now sort of morphing into somebody with white hair and wrinkles. And then I showed it to them. Almost all of them were horrified at seeing the progression of like, oh my God, that's what I'm going to look like. This awful. Some of them couldn't breathe. It literally took their breath away. But only one guy was like, I think I look pretty good. Yeah. He was the outlier for sure. But what was important is that all of them could now concretely visualize what that, what that future self would look like. And then had them sort of, you know, take some time to think about what their day would be like. Now that you know what you look like, what you might look like. Think about what that person will be doing in retirement. So they spent five minutes brainstorming, daydreaming about what that would look like. And then afterwards I said, now, okay, now think about retirement. Like right now, you right now, 
with the job that you have, what's your interest in saving for retirement? And all of them were now like, okay, I get it. I, I, I get the importance of it. And I'm going to start feel, uh, figuring out how I can save for retirement. So, you know, they weren't being paid to say that answer. There was no incentive for them to have that sort of mental shift, but, but they did, but they did realize now, like, I get it. I can understand how my choices today would benefit myself in, um, you know, in 40 years time. That is so interesting to me because I remember this weird moment in high school. We had a biology teacher who was talking about smoking. You know, I'm a kid of the 80s and 90s. So back then they were trying to get us not to smoke. And I remember him saying that often when you're a teenager, you'll do these things that when you're 50 or 60 or 70, you'll wish you hadn't done. Right? Like right now as a teenager or as a 20-year-old or even a 30-year-old or whatever, you may not have the kids or the grandkids. You may not need to worry about your lung health or your heart health because you're not worried about dying young and missing out on all of those things. But at a certain point in your life, he drilled this into us. He's like, at a certain point, you'll look back and you'll be like, I wish I had more years because I wish I hadn't done this stuff because right now, this version of me really wishes <laughs> that I had those things that the other version of me didn't do. And it like it like it stuck with me, and so I, I I love the idea of playing with time, of imagining what I could have if I forced myself today to do stuff, or what I couldn't have. Where this falls down is is two areas for me. Where where it falls short is long term efficacy. So something that's super on my heart or super impactful or super motivating today wears out over time, and the other area which I struggle with the most is I just doubt the visualization, right? Like, okay, maybe, maybe someone else can do it, but, but I don't know if I can. Or maybe I can do it, but I'll get there and I won't like it. Or just like all of that doubt, all of those fears, I, if you can't visualize it, then how does this even help us? So, right. so <laughs> what do we do with those two things? Yeah, I mean, those are, those are big ones for sure. So let's see, let's see if we can take them one by one. The, the first was... Efficacy uh, over time. Yeah. yeah, efficacy over time. So an important part about goal setting is that we don't just leave that long-term goal as what we're constantly working for, because that would be exhausting, right? If we're like, all right, here I am 20, 30, 40 years old, and I got to be making choices now so that me at 60, 70, or 80 is going to have a better life. And then like, good luck, <laughs> go for it and see what the next 20 to 40 years brings for you. That's setting a goal that's just so far off that it's of course going to be challenging to make the daily decisions, the daily choices, like not smoking today um, so that you have a better life when you're 80. So, you know, we don't want to keep it at that level. First of all, when we set goals, yes, we need to have that long-term vision, but we need to couple it with concrete action planning in the here and now. What can we concretely do today that's going to help us make progress that's related to that long-term objective that we're working to achieve and we also need to think about the obstacles that we might experience along the way when we're setting that goal. What's going to be the stumbling point and what can we do about it? Now, both of those, thinking concretely and uh, foreshadowing failures or thinking about those obstacles, you know, that that's helpful because it's going to take that the intense energy out of it, of the like constantly having to make a sacrifice, constantly choosing to remind yourself about what you're doing for 40 years benefit. We need to make it a habit. First of all, like we shouldn't be putting in all of this cognitive effort. Every time there's a choice point, we need to automate the decision that we would like to be making. So the concrete action planning can include like if the and foreshadowing obstacles, if we pair them together, like if this happens, I'll do this instead. If this happens, um, I'll do I'll do Y instead of Z. Now, it sounds really simple, but that if then pairing is a way to make a habit out of the choice. Right. So that we're taking the thinking out of it. We already have the contingency set up. And a lot of times those are really good if we can have the if part be a, a visual spark, something that we're seeing in the environment. So let's, let's be concrete about it. Like, let's do it with smoking. You know, if I see somebody who's standing, if I see a friend who's standing at the corner who's smoking a cigarette, then I'm going to turn around and walk the other way so that I don't pass by them. And I'm not having that awkward conversation of like, hey, do you want one? You want to have a smoke? Uh, and then having to say no, and then having to explain yourself. Or if I go out with friends and you're trying to drink less, if I go out with friends, then I'm going to instantly order a seltzer with lime that looks like a gin and tonic, right? So then you don't have to have that awkward conversation of like, hey, can I get you a beer? No, I already got a drink, right? So you're setting up these contingencies, like if this happens and here's my backup plan so that you're not having to think through how am I going to handle this temptation? 
How am I going to overcome this obstacle? It's already sort of a go-to strategy for you. So that's what I would advise is not just set a goal for 20 years time and then just hope every day you're going to be able to figure out the right path to get there because it's going to be too tiring and it's not going to work. And you're not going to be able to push through the obstacles that inevitably you'll run across. That is so helpful. You know, uh, there have been times where I meal prep before going out somewhere and I'll bring my own food and it kind of upsets the hosts. <laughs> you know, they're like, we cooked all this stuff. And I'm like, cool, thank you. I brought my own thing, you know, because I don't want to eat your dessert or I don't want to do these yeah. other things. And then there's other times where I just don't think that far ahead. And then inevitably I, I, I give up. But I always have felt like it's like a lack of discipline on my part or I'm lazy or like I should be stronger or I should be able. And I know we're not supposed to use the word should. But is there is there a gap between really actually like you? some of this is on us to develop better discipline? Some of this is on us to do the hard thing? Some of this is on us to sacrifice? Because it's not always going to be easy all the time. Or are we too hard on ourselves and we actually just need to make things easier and just accept the fact that we're not going to be able to hold to a strict diet for years upon years upon years for the next 20 or 30 years? Yeah. I mean, yes, we're too hard on ourselves. And then we do ourselves a disservice as we reflect on those experiences. We use words like failure, like oh, I failed at that. I'm a failure. I, I, I failed at this diet. I failed at this goal. Um, failure is a super loaded word, right? It has so much stigma associated with it. And it's something we really, especially in North America, you know, seek to avoid. I don't want to be a failure because especially in North America, we're pushed to be at the top, right? We are supposed to be the best. That's sort of the ethos of, of this culture. And so when we feel like we have fallen short of that, like it, it really kind of shakes our worldview and our sense of self. So, you know, as much as possible, I try to like not use the word failure, of course, there's moment like uh, I haven't succeeded at everything, but I don't call myself a failure. I don't use that label. And I encourage, you know, all of us to start thinking rather than about failure or I can't make this. I, I didn't hit this mark is like this is an opportunity for learning. Right. If I stumbled here, if I had that dessert, I didn't fail at my diet. Right. I didn't fail at this week's you know caloric intake uh, metric that I was trying to hit. It's an opportunity for me to learn why did that go wrong for me? What can I do differently in the future so that I don't make that one choice again? It was one choice. It's not a failure. But it's when we have those moments that people say, like, I failed at it, throw in the towel, you know, and don't reflect, but instead pivot to a new goal, right? Or they give up entirely at pursuing that one. So we are too hard on ourselves. We use these labels that, so that really- when I are, eat yeah. when I eat the entire box of Oreo cookies, I'm not failing. I just, I just need to, to remind myself not to eat an entire box of Oreo cookies. Well, but yeah, but did that work? I mean, you probably reminded yourself in the first time and reminding yourself again won't work. So like, what's a new strategy, right? Like it's a moment of reflection and for trying out something new for creative problem solving, right? So rather than saying, yeah, I failed, which, you know, maybe, yeah, I think eating a <laughs> box of Oreos probably is a failure, but it's when we use those labels that we do ourselves a disservice. So we can adopt more of a growth orientation, a growth mindset, rather than wanting to label ourselves with these fixed traits like failure, like you're a failure or you failed at this goal. No, it's just an opportunity for trying to figure out a new way forward. And so to circle back around on the other challenge that, that I bump up against is the doubt. Or, you know, I was telling you earlier before we recorded that I have a bit of a scratchy throat because I did, um, I did a, a benchmark row at my gym today. So... For the most part, I would typically row a 500 meter row in about a minute 20, a minute 21. And then last spring, unbeknownst to me, I was, I was freaking out about this row, but I started visualizing. I started thinking, okay, what would like a minute 18 row feel like? And how much would it hurt? And, and what would I do at a certain meter like distance? And what would I do to push through? And I just started visualizing, like imagining myself being 45 seconds in and going, there's only 30 seconds left. And it's just like I imagined it. And suddenly I shaved off like three seconds. And so today I was like so nervous because I, I got such a good time last time. So I'm like, I don't think like, can I beat a minute 17, like a minute 17, seven? Can I do that? I don't know. I worked so hard last time. What if I don't? Then I got to the gym and I found out that someone else had rode a minute 16. Now, not <laughs> flat, but they had broken my previous time. So I thought, okay, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And I just started visualizing again. Okay, like, like I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. I got a minute 16 too. So like, I, I feel like, okay, I'm proving to myself in real time that if I believe it and I see it and I visualize it, it can work. And yet, when it comes to some business goals, when it comes to hiring, when it comes to uh, making investments, 
when it comes to what's going on with inflation and the stock market and the political environment and all the uncertainty, when it comes to other areas, sometimes I set these real, like I, can, I, I know that they will happen one day. <sighs> I'm still not sure. I still worry. I still fear. I still doubt. I don't know if I have it. I don't know if I'll surround myself with the right people. I don't know if it'll happen in the right time. Like it's just, if I don't truly believe it, the visualization doesn't seem to help. Mm-hmm. How do we close that gap? Yeah. I mean, for me, I think it comes down to like not trusting my memory. A lot of what you were talking about in these, in these anecdotes was about like remembering what my past time was, remembering what somebody else did, remembering how I was able to talk to myself in encouraging ways. And then, and then sort of comparing like today to, to the past and, and was this experience better or worse now for a lot of people. And for me in particular, that's not a good way to figure out if I'm making progress you know, so a lot. And so to put it in the context of financial decision-making, a tactic that a lot of like more novice investors use is that they check their portfolio too frequently. And then they react to what it is that they're seeing locally, right? That they sell off or they buy, you know, when maybe they should be holding firm and whatever that position is either like not entering the market, with that stock or letting it go too early because they are so like myopically focused on a little blip uh, in the longer term trajectory. Now we do that to ourselves too. Too, when we're trying to assess where are we at with our own progress and other goals as well, that we are not a very good personal accountant when we rely just on our own memories. At one point, a couple of years back when I was telling you like my, my son was just born, I was trying to do it all and like still be cool. And I definitely felt like when he was, was born, like I became really uncool. People came over like, oh, let's see the new baby. Like, oh, what's going on? And I had like nothing interesting to say. I used to be very interesting and find myself in the craziest of circumstances. Like I went to go renew my driver's license at the DMV and they told me I couldn't because there was a warrant out for my arrest for, uh, for murder. <laughs> Murder. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I was I racking don't my brain. murdering anyone. <laughs> I know. That's what I was like. Did I do it? You know, I was like, and like for a split second, I thought, I guess it's possible in my life I did, but like, what are they talking about? Rather than just like, no. So like that's my past is like falling into these situations. And, and then suddenly where, they're now like, how's it going? You're like, well, last uh yeah. eight or nine days ago, I went out and did something. <laughs> right. Like I changed a bunch of poopy diapers today. And they're like, that is really not interesting. And so like, I got to get my cool factor back. I need some stories, like the whole like potential murderer thing. First of all, I should put on the record. I didn't do it. And I have a, a, a letter from the governor saying I didn't do it. I hold on to that. Cause it's just also kind of oh, cool. Um, pardoned. <laughs> yeah, I know I say that, but it's like, actually I didn't get pardoned. Cause I didn't do it. You only get pardoned if you actually did do it. But anyway, whatever. That's a, that's a legal technicality that I'm not qualified to talk about. Anyway, so I decided I want to be a rock drummer. Like I am, I have a musical background, but drumming is not my thing. My husband is a drummer. He's really good. He's a very good rock drummer. Uh, and so I was like, I want to be cool like him. Uh, and so I decided to learn how to like, like really play one song pretty, pretty amazingly well. And I was going to put on a show. I was going to hold myself publicly accountable. And then I was going to write a book about it using all these strategies I'm talking with you about to see if, if I can like do this while my son is one year old and we live in a one bedroom apartment in Manhattan. All right. Kind of a dumb goal, but like, like, I think this will make me cool again if I try this. I don't know if it did, but that was that was what the goal that I had set. But because there's whole public accountability aspect of it, um, I knew that like I just was feeling like I am getting nowhere. Like I've set this goal, this thing, this show is going to happen. I have to be able to play this song but I am, I don't have time. Like I can't, I'm not getting any better. My coordination is still awful. I knew that would be the challenge. I'm not getting any better. But then I decided to download this app. It's called the reporter app. And you can, there's lots of apps that are like this, but it would like randomly ping my phone a couple times a day and ask me like, Hey, did you play drums since the last time I asked you if I mostly, I said no, but if I had said yes, it's like, how did you feel about it? And so then I just like quickly described my experience. I did that for a month downloaded my data. And I felt like, well, this was an awful month. Like I hardly practiced at all. And I, and I am not getting any better, but my actual data told me otherwise. It said, actually, you know, when I started this, I cried because it was so awful. I cried at my, cause it sounded so awful. I like scared myself, I guess. But by the end of the month, there were like my husband, a real drummer gave me a compliment, like a legit compliment and not because he's married to me or whatever, because he doesn't do that. He doesn't believe in that, which is unfortunate for other reasons, but, but like I was <laughs> getting better, but I couldn't feel it. Right. Because I'm so, I was so worried about like my long-term goal. And am I going to actually, you know, be able to, to, to do this thing that I was really focused on the negative. I was focused on, on my failures. I was focused on like all the times I didn't practice or all the times that I was really struggling with to get a lick down. 
And I wasn't giving myself credit for like the improvements because I couldn't see them because I couldn't remember them because I was so focused on what felt like not big enough progress. And that's what I'm saying is like, we're not very good personal accountants. Our brains have evolved to have us not remember everything, but to remember some things. Um, And mostly things that are good, right? That's where self-esteem comes from. That's where self-efficacy comes from is by pulling up from our memory, our successes and our beliefs and our abilities and what our strengths are and letting go of those embarrassing moments um, or the missteps that we've made uh, or the things that we're not very good at. And and so when we have to figure out how are we doing with respect to a goal that we're making, we need to be able to zoom out and sort of see the bigger, fuller picture that our brains don't allow us to have. Again, taking it back to like investing, right? If we focus too myopically on what's happening today in the market or this week in the market, we might sell off something that actually is is going up despite a, a small blip today. So did you just say that our brains are built to to retain and remember the good stuff? Because I feel like, yeah, there's some good stuff there, but I am... And maybe this is because I tend to fall more in a fixed mindset as opposed to the gross minds, growth mm-hmm. mindset point of view. But but I work, have to work so hard to let go of all the bad stuff. The bad stuff's super easy for me to focus on. I could live my whole life there. Mm-hmm. It's the good stuff that I actually have to work really hard to, to retain. Yeah, for me too, I resonate with that. And, and other people probably resonate with that too. And, and you know, to a point where you know, some people could be diagnosed as having you know, depressive anxiety because of the ruminations, not being able to let go of the, of the negative. And so I resonate with that also. My husband, like there are individual differences. He like completely doesn't remember his mistakes. He, and I probably don't either, right? To like be perfectly honest, but there are things like he just like legitimately does not remember the things that are discordant with his self-view. And that is common. We have this vision of, of who we are as people, and when our experiences sort of fall in line with that, they stick easier. The things that we do that are aligned with who we think we are, um, they get folded into our narrative a little bit more easier because it doesn't require that we change our whole sense of self or our self-concept to try to integrate something that doesn't really fit very well. So yes, um, there there's different sort of personality styles about holding on or ruminating over the bad, but not everybody does that, right? Which is why it might be hard for you to think like, that could be true. It's hard for me to think it could be true, but I've met those people and I married one. <laughs> <laughs> the other, the other things that um, that I know serve me so well, but you know, I, our greatest strengths are our greatest weaknesses. So wh- whenever we look at someone, we go, "Oh, they have this amazing thing." We're kind of ignoring all the baggage that comes with it. But two things: my wife often reminds me she thinks that I'm far too black and white about everything. Mm-hmm. And I am very black and white about things, mm-hmm. which, which also means I'm either like super obsessed and dedicated. Or frankly, I couldn't care less. And so I'm very black and white, which I believe serves me for these kind of goals, this kind of zoning in, this kind of like, this is the only thing that matters right now. And I'm going to ignore every other thing, including my kids, you know, saying, Dad, and I'm just like, nope, I'm focused on this. And the second thing that serves me well, I think, is I'm extremely imaginative. So like, I can very easily place myself, you know, in, in a future state, or I can imagine how things could be. Now, there's downsides to both of these things. Being so imaginative means that like, I have crazy anxiety because I can imagine every possible thing going wrong in every possible area. And I'm so black and white on things that I don't leave a lot of room for like balance or, or gray. Or as I describe these to you, and maybe our listeners uh, uh, identify with these things as high achievers, um, how much of this should we just like, these are my strengths. They come with some weaknesses. Gonna just accept them and lean into them. And uh, as it relates to goal setting and, and accomplishing things, and how much of this should we try to like soften out? And it would serve me better to live a little bit more in the grays. And it would serve me better to maybe not be so visualized or visually mm-hmm. the fu- visualizing the future because it comes with anxiety and other things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think at some point we're all going to need to pivot. That a path that we're taking or a plan of action isn't quite right, isn't quite unfolding the way that we thought it would or that we would want. So that creativity that you're talking about is something that would serve us well to cultivate. Now, if that doesn't come naturally for some for some of us, um, then you know what can we do about it? Well, we can we can work to change our mood because our creativity follows. There's a lot of research out there showing that when we're in a positive mood, when we're feeling happy, that that's where our ability to think more expansively, to find connections that. Um, that we hadn't otherwise seen, that comes more naturally. It comes easier when we're in a positive mood. And when we're in a negative mood, when we're feeling down, if we let ourselves stay in that spot, 
Um, you know, there's some anecdotes that like Picasso's blue period came from his state of depression and some of his great, greatest work came out of that like misery. But that's not the case for most people. <laughs> we're, you know, we're, we're more fixated and we, we come narrowly focused and it's hard for us to think of creative solutions to problems when we're in that negative state. We want to have that skill, that creative power, which we will need when we need to troubleshoot our, our way out of a problem or find a unique solution that we haven't used before. You know, taking time to go for a walk, taking the time to go to the gym, taking the time to to like go out to dinner, drinks with friends, like whatever works for you to put you in a happy place. That is time well spent. That's not just try, trying to give your brain a break, but it's about being intentional about crafting a mood that will have these consequences that could be beneficial for fostering creativity. Um, now, like, should we do that? Should we try to create something, create a space, a mental place that isn't natural for us. That's not really for me to say, like, if, if you're not happy with how things are going, here's a tool that you can use and cultivate in order to put yourself in a different place. Uh, should you lean into who you are as a person and, and sort of dogmatically um, go down that path saying like, you know, I accept myself and I'm not, I don't want to work to change it. Um, is that okay to do? That's that's not for me. I'm not a clinical psychologist for, for me to diagnose that, but it's, we can reflect on our experiences and see, well, does that work or does it not work? Um, has your approach always helped you get out of tricky spots? Is it working in terms of like, you know, the social dynamics in your workplace or in your home life for you to take this approach? And if not, here's a tactic you can use to try to change that. So if I wanted to get better at setting goals, which I do, and I wanted to stay motivated to achieve those goals, what would be the like must have steps that I should follow? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, we've talked about them a little bit. There's dreaming big, knowing what it is that you're working towards. People call it bucket lists. Other people use dream boards or vision boards. Some people have mission statements, you know, like that's important to have. Uh, and for some people, that's a real challenge to figure it out. Like, what do I want to do with my life? So it's that that's a big undertaking, but we can't stop the process of goal setting there. Some people do stop the process of goal setting. Like, you know, if I can put together this visual montage, a dream board or a vision board of what I want my life to look like, then I put that positive vibe out there and I'm going to increase the odds of success because now I'm thinking positively. That doesn't seem to be the case. Science doesn't support that, that, that vision boards have that sort of karma like power um, to actually help you achieve your goals. Instead, some evidence suggests it actually might backfire that now having achieved, like figured out what I want to do with my life leads us to sort of like fall back on our laurels unmotivated um, to actually take the steps we need to get there because we're feeling good about figuring out what it is in fact that we want out of our life. Um, so, you know, that's an aside. So we feel like we kind of feel like the hard work is done. <laughs> yeah, totally. I yeah, figured it out. Of, I don't need to actually yeah. work towards it. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to be too negative about it because this is something that a lot of people do because it, it feels right for them. And having figured that out is really important. It's just that, you know, research done by colleagues of mine at New York University uh, measured, they measured systolic blood pressure. What happens when people do that? Like daydreaming, what is it that your perfect life will look like? Systolic blood pressure tended to decrease. Now I'm all about finding ways to lower blood pressure. Like I could use a little bit more chilling out too. But in this context, psychologically, what we know is that it's a marker of our body's readiness to get up and act, to do something, you know, um, right before horses are like going to take off out of their gates, like in a race, systolic blood pressure goes up. These horses are not moving. They are fixed in, the, in a spot, but in anticipation of doing something big, their systolic blood pressure goes up. If we're, you know, people are on the brink of doing hard math problems, they're just going to sit there and focus their cognitive efforts, systolic blood pressure goes up. So psychologists know that an increase in systolic blood pressure means like, all right, let's do this thing. I'm all in. And a decrease in blood pressure means like, okay, cool. You know, I feel a bit of satisfaction. I've accomplished something. It's, it's sort of the relaxation that comes after hitting a mark, after meeting a goal. So when people just stop the process of goal setting at that, like fantasizing stage, systolic blood pressure has been shown to decrease, which means like, we're not ready. We're not excited to take on the next step. We're like, Hey, I just did something big. Okay, cool. So if we want to be able to hit our goals, we can't just stop that process of goal setting at thinking about what that is that we want to achieve. We have to pair it secondly with concrete action planning, setting smaller sub goals so that we can become better accountants for our own progress, thinking concretely, what can I do? Not just today, but thinking about in terms of a week, what can I do this week? When will I carve out time this week? 
thinking more expansively about how we organize our time, the concrete actions that we will take along the way to hit a sub goal to build up to this bigger goal is step two. Step three is, again, like we've already mentioned, foreshadowing the obstacles, thinking concretely about what could I come upon that's going to be a stumbling point where I might throw in the towel and coming up with that plan B and plan C in advance. Because when we're sort of drowning in the muck of it all, when we're up against a challenge, um, that's when we're short on time, thin on resources. We might be feeling pretty crappy about it right now, and we don't have all of the energy and opportunity to troubleshoot a unique way out of this situation. We need to be able to pivot quickly to what that backup plan is that we've already foreshadowed. It's our safety net that we have put into place. Um, and that three-step plan is effective for helping us to increase the odds that we actually meet our goals. Um, there's one cool story that I want to share about Michael Phelps, who is like, you know, part of his his career, um, his coaching involved this sort of three-step plan. Uh, and the most interesting part comes in terms of his foreshadowing failures or these obstacles he might experience. Back in 2008, he was in the Beijing Olympics. It's the first time that he was on the international stage in a, in a really dramatic way where the whole world was watching and everybody was watching because he was about to do something that nobody else had ever done in the history of the Olympics, which was win eight gold medals in a single Olympic game. At the time of this story, he had already won seven and he just had the 200 fly in front of him to, to win. And he, that's like his jam. That is totally what he what he aced. And, and so it was like pretty he had pretty high confidence that he was going to be able to get this job done. Unfortunately, when he dove in, his goggles started to leak. And by the time he was on the last leg of this race, his goggles were completely filled with water and he was swimming blind. Now, for me, I would have completely panicked, sunk to the bottom if I ever found myself in a pool in that situation anyway, which would never would have happened. My six-year-old is a better swimmer than I am. But he didn't panic because this was something that he had planned for. He and his coach had already foreshadowed goggles not working. What are you going to do? What's your plan B? And in fact, some um, you know urban legend is that his coach would like pull his goggles off of his head and practice as he jumped in and smash them on the ground, breaking them, I guess, for dramatic effect, but so that he would have to practice not being able to see as he, as he was swimming. So in that moment, when he realized like, okay, I can't see anything and I just have one uh, length of the pool left to go, he just quickly turned to his plan B, which was counting his strokes. He knew how many strokes it would take for him to get from one end of the pool to the other. So he did that instantly, right? Without losing a beat. Um, and he won that 200 meter fly. He won his eighth gold medal and he'd go on to win 15 more medals in his career. So a pretty amazing guy. And that key moment in, in his career trajectory probably is the result of having foreshadowed problems and practicing what would you do should those come up along the way. So that, you know, he was able, he was able to quickly pivot without having to think about it. That is an extraordinary story. And, you know, when I speak to uh, Navy SEALs, or athletes, or even as you recount that story, there's something about the way that they attack a problem or, you know, I'll, I'll speak to a Navy SEAL and I'll say, well, you know, when we sit down and we do our plan and then we do our meetings and then we have our goals and then we have our things and then we have our backups and then we have our training and then we do the thing. And then after we have a debrief and we learn and we change, and we update the process. I think, I don't know anyone who does this much work, uh, right. this much peripheral work for the moment, right? Like the fact that, you know, Phelps, and their coach spent all of this time doing all of these plan Bs for all of this work to show up for the moment. I think most of us, at least me especially, thinks that it's about the moment. Yeah. And I don't have enough time for all this other stuff because I'm so busy trying to have so many moments. I'm trying to ha be like the best as a dad and as a husband and as a business owner and I'm running a bunch of different things and I'm, I'm just spread way too thin that I don't have the time that it takes to focus on this one thing put the time, put the plan into place, follow the three steps, forecast what could go wrong, train and practice to be really great at it. And yet, every uber successful person I connect with does this. They spend mm -hmm. a lot of time on planning. They spend a lot of time on reflection. They spend a lot of time on systems and, and tweaking things. And they do very few things, but they just put so much time into it. Mm -hmm. And as you're talking, I'm realizing I'm just trying to do way too many things. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That could be part of it. But also it's about efficiency too. So, you know, me thinking about how could I approach life like a Navy SEAL, I also would agree like there's just not time to do that. So a couple of things, maybe we need to triage then. Well, what are the things in our life that are worth carving out time to do that kind of major planning that a Navy SEAL does? 
but also how could we make for maybe some of those like moderately important goals that do require some planning? How can we be more efficient with our way that we go about doing that planning? I talked to a pretty amazing guy. His name's uh, Giorgio Piccoli. And, um, you know, he's a, he at the time of, of like learning about his backstory, he was a really young, very successful CEO of uh, of, a, of an art shipping company. He would partner with local artists all around the world to, to create, have them create their art and then get it in the hands of new art collectors. Like an, that's emerging market, emerging artists, emerging collectors and pair them up and then and like make all these international arrangements happen. Um, so very cool. And like, you know, his success uh, and his profitability within the first year and then onward has just been really amazing. And so it's just trying to, you know, pick his brain too. Like, how do you do that? How are you able to handle all this? Um, you know, and he said, one of the things that he does is that it requires some creative problem solving to deal with international laws or to like find new, new entry points to deal with new artists and whatever is that he needs to be really creative and he practices being creative so that when he actually needs to be creative for, for solving some business problem, he has built up that skill set. So every morning he wakes up and he tries to think about, he makes a list of 10, 10 things. And and then he just gives himself some new list to to create like 10, 10, uh, you know, business mergers that could, could reshape an industry. Like, like what if uh, Travelocity and Babel partnered up? If we, if those two companies merged as one, what could happen to how people are able to travel internationally and learn new languages at the same time, right? Or how could I improve the experience on airlines for somebody uh, in a wheelchair? And then he just tries to think of like, what are those, you know, like, so it's just 10. And I was like, how long have you been doing this? And he said, for 10 years, at the point that I asked him every day for 10 years. And I was like, oh my God. And, you know, and he said, and I saved those lists too. So he had like, all of these lists every day for every year for 10 years, he has these lists. And I said, like, did any of those ideas ever become financially viable? Or like, did they become a new company for you or anything like that? And he said, no. And I was like, then why do you do it? And how can you motivate yourself? And he said, it's because that's how I practice creative problem solving so that when I need it for my job, it's a skill that I can easily turn to. So, you know, that's an example, I think, of how he's built up an efficiency in his own cognitive architecture is by practicing the skill set so that it's there when he needs it. What a great story, too. You're so... (laughs) As we wrap up the conversation, I I just want to ask you one final question. For you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? You know, it's it's avoid labeling. We don't want to label ourselves. We don't want to label other people. We stymie our own progress and potential and possibilities. And we do that for other people too when we put labels, like the word failure, right? Let's get rid of that word failure. But also labeling ourselves as successful or saying or not successful or I can do this, I can't do this, I'm not cut out for this line of work or I am. It becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. Um, and you know, it just it, it makes life a lot less fun when you don't even allow yourself to enter some space because you don't think you have what it takes. Try it out, fail. If it doesn't work out, you've at least got a funny story to tell. 